about does health insurance equal access to health care? My name is uh, Matthew Foley. I'm an emergency medicine physician and a volunteer at the Brooklyn Free Clinic. Very happy to be here. On the day I was asked to come talk here, I was working in the emergency department um, and I had a patient that uh, illustrated um, if health insurance is access to care. And that is a question of my talk. Um, and I'll kind of blow the punchline of what I believe, and I don't believe health insurance equals access to health care, especially in underserved communities. A patient came in on that day that I was working, uh, called the paramedics, and complained of chest pain and shortness of breath. On the way to the hospital, her heart stopped, she stopped breathing, and she came into the emergency department with her son. While our team was trying to resuscitate this patient, I was trying to get information from the son, seeing what her health background is, seeing what medication she may take. And the son told me that, well, she's been complaining of chest pain and shortness of breath for about two weeks. And that's where it hit me. Her perception of her access was her reality of her access. She didn't feel she had any. She was having problems for two weeks, and we could have probably prevented this visit to the emergency department that day, but she didn't have any access. We tried to resuscitate her for about 30 minutes, and she didn't make it, she died. And I went out to tell the family of the son, and it never gets easier. People say, you get accustomed to it, you never do. And sitting next to the son was the husband. And I introduced myself and I asked, he, he looked like the husband, so I asked if he's a family member. He nodded. And I said, are you the husband? And he nodded. And then I proceeded to tell the son and the husband um, that the family member had died. And then after that, as I usually do, I, I asked a little bit about the patient. Um, because I've been trying to resuscitate this patient and I, I've never met them. I don't know anything. I don't have any prior records. And I'm talking to the son back and forth, and about a minute or two minutes goes by, and the husband leans over to his son and says, Maury, that's Haitian and Creole for, did she die? He had no idea. We were talking in front of him for two minutes. He had no idea his wife died. And my argument is that we don't have a healthcare system. I don't know anything about these patients when they come into the emergency department. I don't know if they speak patient Creole. I don't even know their past medical history. The patient didn't know any access point to get health care for the prior two weeks that she was having chest pain and shortness of breath. This is a diagram I roughly put together that represents how I see our health insurance system right now. I don't believe we truly have a system for health care. You can see in the middle there's health insurance and it provides payments to hospitals and there's a definitely a lot of entities not listed up there. Um, rehab facilities, um, other specialists, emergency department, um, but it doesn't really interconnect obviously with our free clinic doesn't necessarily interconnect with preventative care or community outreach, some of the things we're doing here today. The Urban Institute, the Arthur Ashe Urban Institute in Flatbush, they outreach to hairstylists because the hairstylist customers would rather talk to their hairstylist about their health care than go see a health care professional and they give blood pressure and heart rate. But that doesn't come back to the primary care physician or to the emergency department if they come in two weeks later. There's no interconnection there. Legal help is another part that's very important in underserved um, and low income um, areas because a lot of these people live in uh, conditions that are unhealthy and they may need help to get out of those conditions. 
And if we set up that ability or legal help to, to help them get out of those good decisions, it's often successful. And obviously shelters. I'm going to discuss approximately these three points and what, what we've been discussing so far. And the first one is healthcare right or privilege. Um, also, do we have a healthcare system or an insurance system and access to healthcare and some solutions for that and how to fund that. So we've been grappling over whether healthcare is a right or a privilege in this country for a lot of years. It's a very politically charged debate. I'm not going to debate whether it's a right or a privilege. What I'm going to argue is that we've already decided. And the two reasons I'm going to list of why we've decided is these two acts here. In 1986, we had the Emergency Medical Treatment Act of Labor Act that says every patient who shows up to the emergency department regardless of pay, will get medical screening. This is how I define my role in the safety net of healthcare. Now, it's not a system, it is an access point, but it's not a system. It's a pretty good system for the value we pay. About 2% of the healthcare dollar goes into emergency care services. That includes first responders, the ambulances, the paramedics, and we see about 30% of total patient visits each year. When we decided that people in our country can show up to the emergency department and get care, this was great. This was something I fought for. This is nothing, I don't want a patient showing up on my front doorstep with a bullet wound in their shoulder or complaining of chest pain and me getting on my knees saying, I, what's your health insurance? I'm not sure if we can help you today. Um, let me just check, I'll be right back and put your finger in the hole and we'll see if we can, our hospital gets paid for them. That, that's nothing that we want. That's nothing that's society and it sounds absurd to talk about. We don't have that because of the act. A second act that we have is the most recent one, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act. Now this doesn't really, in my view, develop a health care system. I think so far it's more developing a health insurance system something that we've heard of in the talks before us. When I signed up for my health care, I just recently moved to Brooklyn again. I came back because I loved it so much. I signed up for health care. But I didn't sign up for health care. I signed up for health insurance. And it really isn't health insurance. It's really a down payment for the inevitable. <laughs> when my car gets broken or needs an oil change, my car insurance doesn't pay for that. But when I go to visit my primary care doctor for whatever reason, I expect the health insurance to pay for that. We're pooling costs for something that we expect to pay for. Life insurance, I have life insurance. I hope never to use it. It's not the inevitable. I hope. <laughs> I'll die eventually. But it's definitely, I hope to get rid of my life insurance by the time that that occurs. Health insurance isn't like that. We are going to use it. We're going to use our health insurance as a down payment and we pay our premiums with the expectation to have our um, health care paid for moving forward. When the Affordable Care Act came along, we developed these health exchanges that was discussed earlier. Health insurance exchanges is building a health insurance system, not necessarily a health care system. So when the federal government gave California $900 million to build a health insurance exchange, that seemed like a lot of money to me. I don't know where all that money goes to. Some of it is in outreach, some of it is building the website. Actually, $187 million of it is just to build the website. Some of it is to enroll people. New York received, so far, about $300 million for the same thing maybe get about 500 million, and it's to build the insurance system, or health insurance system. What I'm not saying is it needed. I'm just questioning where our money is going for healthcare. To compare e-surance, and I don't own stock in any of the companies I talk about, e-surance I see on commercials and these superheroes that sell insurance, insurance, and they have different insurance products. It cost them about $5.7 million in venture capital funding to start their company. That's advertising, that's their website, that's their outreach. Facebook, to launch, was about $13.7 million. 
That's just a comparison. I don't know how much it actually costs to build a health insurance exchange. I'm just questioning the $187 million that the federal government is providing one state to build a website. We may be able to use some of that money elsewhere. This may be a pretty good place. One of the reasons I'm an emergency medicine physician is because, well, I went to medical school and I wanted to be a primary care physician or an orthopedic surgeon. It turned out I didn't really like cutting bones and putting them back together as much as I thought I would. And I wanted to serve in an underserved area. So becoming a primary care physician and knowing what Medicaid pays in underserved areas is a reason why primary care providers, specialists, and yes, they are specialists, we, we, we speak about primary care providers as generalists, but they graduate medical school and they specialize in primary care for three years, a skill that I don't have, and they provide primary care. So, when knowing that Medicaid doesn't provide well enough to open up a practice in an underserved area, didn't seem like it was going to work. Didn't seem like I was going to be able to have a business. Um, lucky for me, there isn't enough primary care physicians as there are. I can be an emergency medicine physician and volunteer at the Berkeley Free Clinic. I'm not as good at it as a primary care physician. I never specialize in primary care, but I provide that care because I enjoy doing it. In 2010, our primary care physician shortage was 9,000. It's not getting better. In 2025, it'll be 65,000. We're gonna have everybody insured because of the Affordable Care Act. Once they're insured, where are they gonna get their care? Where is the access gonna come from? Another place that we can build a health care system, see if this goes forward, or where we can get funding from it, in New York is one of the few states, one of only seven states, that will receive, will gain money, or actually save money, when the Affordable Care Act kicks in. It's been saved because right now it primarily pays all of its Medicaid, um, and it is what is required come 2014 of Medicaid. But in 2014, the federal government's gonna start paying 100% of it for the first three years and about 90% of it thereafter. So New York State's gonna save $33 billion in about eight years. It seems like a lot of money to me. There's a lot of places that we can place that money. And I propose that it should go right back to the people who are saving you that money. It's coming from Medicaid. It's coming from Medicaid savings. Insurance paid to underserved, low-income areas. We can take that money and build a health care system in those areas. I don't want it to go into the New York State General Fund and it be distributed somewhere else. It should go back to the people that it's been for. This is maybe a goal of mine, having a healthcare system, where the patient that maybe saw her hairstyles and complained of chest pain and shortness of breath two weeks prior was referred to a medical home. Who knows what insurance pays her bill and what her insurance would pay for? I have no idea when I sign up for my insurance. I, 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 I'm in a physician. I dabble in health policy. I looked at the health insurance I was signing up for, it was a PPO, it was an IPO, it was an HMO, it was HMO out of it was in product. I had no idea, and I'm, I'm supposed to know this stuff. I still don't know what my, what my health insurance is covered. I have all these books and I read through them and it's so confusing, I don't know what it covers. But a medical home can help us, help us, help clarify that for us. Veterans qualified health centers will obtain extra funding for that. It can be the source that refers you to your primary care provider. If you need it, it can provide you with legal help. If you need it, we can maybe have $33 billion creating a medical home in different areas of East Flatbush for patients to access health care, to have a health care system. And by the way, I put in telemedicine here because we have this archaic way of 
feeling we have to go to a hospital to get health care. We have to sit in our primary care position for an hour before we get health care. We all have phones that are interactive. We can call people. In 1997, the budget, the Balanced Budget Act was made that Medicare would pay for telehealth. And that's a big insurance provider. Right now, 39 states have allowed Medicaid to pay for telehealth. 15 states mandate insurances to pay for telehealth. New York is not one of them. I propose that we submit a bill, get telehealth approved, have a health care system, have telehealth integrate that health care system. We have the funding for it. We're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on health insurance system. We're, we're saving billions of dollars when the Affordable Care Act in this state is put in place. I want our patients to have a health care system that they can access, not a health insurance system that may or may not provide for them. Thank you.